Hello, my name is Mario. Welcome to another video. In today's episode, I will be sharing with you another tip for building microservices in Go, specifically the project layout that I like to use, and just a quick introduction to domain driven design. What is the agenda that we're going to be covering? It consists of three items. Like I said, a quick introduction to domain driven design, uh, a few approaches that I have found uh, for creating your own project layout and the project layouts are like using for building microservices in Go, specifically web microservices in Go. So what is domain driven design? Well, this is something that it was introduced officially by Eric Evans back in 2003 and Martin Fowler likes to define it as an approach to software development that centers the development of on programming a domain model that has a rich understanding of the processes and rules of a domain. What this means in practice is that there is some direct communication be between the domain experts and the technical people that are supposed to be building the software that is going to be modeling whatever domain the experts are in. Basically, think of them in terms of, for example, if we are building a finance system, well, we need uh, people that have finance experience. If we are building something medical, medical related, or pharma, we need to have um, perhaps doctors, doctors, nurses, and people that, that know the domain. The whole point of this is that with uh, having this direct communication between the domain, the domain experts and the technical people, it, allow, it allows us, the technical people, to build something that maps consistently to whatever domain we're trying to build. With the whole idea is that if this is a complex domain that has a bunch of different rules, we can follow the rules as close as possible because we are literally talking the same language which is one of the things that i want to highlight here um, there is an interesting interesting concept called the ubiquitous language which is that's practically what it is defining a language that both the technical people and the domain experts can share and that way they can communicate um, besides that the idea of having bounded context which is again thinking of, in terms of perhaps uh, if you are going to finance, there is a term that is specific to finance that we can separate and therefore we can allow that become a microservice. And again, this is why if you refer to some of the most recent videos talking about microservices or microservices in general, uh, bounded context is one of those terms that always comes up when discussing uh, the uh, comparison between DDD and microservices. Now, to be clear, domain-driven design is, on, is not easy. It takes uh, some understanding. In the context of Go, there is literally just a few resources to give that give you an idea how to do or use DDD with Go, and I will mention those. And it really, in practice, it is recommended for large and complex systems. If you're building a microservice that is supposed to be, I don't know, being used as a demo, which I, I would be thinking why even bother using DD, and if it's something that is really simple um, that doesn't have too much complexity don't even bother trying using DD. the whole point of using again like i said the whole point of using DD is to somehow build a system that is sharing uh, the same language like the, literally the human language between what we're defining what we're implementing what the domain domain experts need and the rules that we have to build and, and implement. There are a bunch of things that are introduced thanks to, to domain driven design that I will be covering when the time comes, when we're actually looking at the actual approach for, for building this kind of uh, software. Now, this is not something new and, and not domain driven design, but more, more the project layouts. And a few, a few other uh, authors already talked about this and I think uh, what we can see if we if we you know specifically look at uh, what Ben Johnson and William William Kennedy uh, were discussing is that uh, the whole idea of um, creating uh, in Go for creating idiomatic code is that you need to try to uh, make sure the types that live in the package are or the types that you're defining in your package live um, make sense and live together as as needed and. Bill Kennedy likes to call this the design of philosophy, the design philosophy in packaging. And I highly, to, highly recommend you to read this blog post. There's a few, few, or I think two or three blog posts that cover um, 
the different approach that, that he likes to take when when discussing and building packages and, and in the end building the services uh, Ben Johnson uh, also does a similar thing and where he's defining a few different ways to locate or, or different places or packages where you should be putting your types that in the end all built together represent the final um, domain or the final implementation. One interest, interesting thing about Jana um, is that she back in 2017 was discussing about naming the packages and again it goes back to to not only building the things that we're going to be using uh, using something like DDD but also making, sh making sure that the code is idiomatic and also at the same time uh, it makes sense in the context of what we're trying to describe. She's describing a bunch of different uh, recommendations that I think I, if you have been uh, exploring how to name packages, it's most likely you already saw this, this uh, blog post. And and finally, uh, Kat, uh, Kat Zian, Zian, I hope I pronounced that correctly. She, uh, I attended GopherCon in 2018 and she gave a presentation about how to do, do how to structure go apps and she covers a, sim a similar approach but it's more uh, related to to how you feel the, the the thing that you're building and again she, she doesn't expi explicitly mentions ddd if i recall correctly but in the end if, if you read all of these um, links or resources you will notice that most of them have the same idea and the whole point of them is to build something using packages that sort of makes sense in the context of what you are building and at the same time, those are idiomatic in the context of what Go developers expect to see when reading code and building your code. Now, in practice, what I decided to do this time is, is uh, build a, uh, implement a new repository on GitHub that happens to have, at the moment, nothing. It's just an empty readme. Well, not an empty readme, an empty project with a readme and just the code module in its initialization right there that describes the structure that I'm using. And it defines a few features that I will be implementing in, in the future videos. And I've been covering a few of them in previous episodes. But I, I just want to make that clear that this is something like a work in progress. And, and, and when the time comes and when I cover a specific feature, I will go back and discuss, oh, okay, why did I do this in the first place? So if you look at the demo that I have here, it's literally empty folders. But I just want to give you an idea of what this is. Uh, what this project is supposed to be and and how everything is mapped to the actual domain and it goes back to the definition of bounded context that I will be covering in the future video in the next one when I'm specifically talking about the project that we're going to be building. Um, the service that I'm implementing this time will be a simple to-do list app management kind of a service thing. Uh, I was I was trying to find a good service that everybody is aware of and is easy to understand, and I didn't want to introduce something that perhaps it wasn't that clear enough for everybody. And I I, I think that all of us have, have built already a to-do management app or CLI or web app or whatever, so we're familiar with the basic rules of managing to-do items. I will I will be adding the features as we go. And I will be introducing the, the different things for, for that in the end makes sense for building a final microservice that, that you can put in production. In practice, most of these things are the same for all the microservices. I mean, you can argue that most of them, depending on the need, require some other things, but most of them follow the same structure. And the structure I like it to follow in this case is I have a build package that happens to include some information about the build binaries or the binaries that we're trying to build uh, most likely using docker and, and docker files if we are using some cloud provider uh, like aws or google cloud we build a folder that defines all the infrastructure logic that we have to define here there for for having and managing everything as a using infrastructure as code the cmd will be consisting of the binaries that will be available via the different either services or task definitions or depending on the cloud provider, whatever they like to call those things. Basically, whatever the pod, if you use Kubernetes or something like that. So the binary that is actually running and, and being uh, exposing the, the features that your customers use. DB is something that we I, I already mentioned in a few videos ago. It includes the migrations and seed the data if needed. And internal, 
is something that people sometimes don't like to to see in projects but again this is a specific to a microservice that happens to be <laughs> web service and it's not a a package or a, or a tool or a go package that you are going to be including directly most of the times however if the use case uh, is needed of if we need to define a way for other go projects to import our packages or, or what we're going to be defining is implementing a public API and whatever API we decide to implement will live under the PKG folder. Again, all of these are sort of conventions, um, which I think make sense in, in the long uh, run. And I have uh, seen uh, have seen them work in real life and I can recommend them. I will be giving you more concrete details about this. I'm not suggesting to name your packages your packages subdomain one and subdomain two these were sort of like examples and with the same is that i want to give you a more a better explanation why this is called postgres or memcached and mysql um, but i will do that in, in in future episodes with that being said i think um i think the important bit about this is that not only show you the idea of this uh, the future episodes but how the actual layout looks like in the beginning but also at the same time to give you more resources so you can look at what is available right now what some other ideas some other people have and the end just you you make your own decision and and i just want to tell you that it, it, again it depends on the project it's trade-offs and this is something that for me has it has been working for a while for again for microservices web APIs for packages or, or some other type of projects it's a different story and I will recommend a different layout but this is what it is for specifically microservices and with that being said thank you for watching and I will talk to you in a different uh, episode until then you know keep it up don't give up goodbye